ಶ್ರುತಿ ಸ್ಮೃತಿ ಪುರಾಣಲಯ ಕರುಣಾಲಯ ನಮಿ ಭಗವತ್ಪಾದ ಶಂಕರ ಲೋಕಶಂಕರ ಶಂಕರ ಶಂಕರಾಚಾರ್ಯ ಕೇಶವ ಪಾದರಾಯಣ ಸೂತ್ರ ಭಾಷ್ಯ ಕೃತೇ ಭಗವಂತ ಪುನಃ ಪುನಃ ಈಶ್ವರೋ ಗುರುರಾತ್ಮೇತಿ ಮೂರ್ತಿ ಭೇದ ವಿಭಾಗಿ ಓಮವತ್ ವ್ಯಾಪ್ತ ದೇಹಾಯ ದಕ್ಷಿಣಾಮೂರ್ತ ನಮಃ ಸದಾ ಶಿವ ಸಮಾರಂಭ ಶಂಕರಾಚಾರ್ಯ ಮಧ್ಯಮ ಅಸ್ಮದಾಚಾರ್ಯ ಪರ್ಯಂತ ವಂದೇ ಗುರು ಪರಂಪರ ಓಂ ಸಹನಾವತು ಸಹನೌ ಭುನಕ್ತು ಸಹವೀರ್ಯ ಕರವಾವಹೈ ತೇಜಸ್ವಿ ನಾವಧೀತಮಸ್ತು ಮಾಷಾವಹೈ ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 so uh, last class we studied about uh, lifestyles two different lifestyles one is a uh, the pravritti marga and nivritti marga this becomes uh, this this is basic understanding of vedanta <clears throat> Uh, it's not uncommon in our uh, in our culture to talk about a life where things are given up they will say life of renunciation very commonly understood say quote and quote normal life which we can probably say pravritti marga and uh, a life where a life they say normally a life where one gives up those normal pursuits but life where one pursues pursues this vedanta so this quote this word normal is a very very interesting word so to say if somebody is normal who decides that somebody is normal the question is asked then a few people decide whether this person is normal whether he is behaving like like the average person like the average human being and uh, so that's the basis of normal see it appears but in any case this pravritti marga is there pravritti means a life of pursuit of dharmartha kama so now that we have defined dharma arth kama we can now define the word normal itself based on that and a life led in pursuit of moksha can be called as nivritti marga nivritti means retreat why it is retreat because it is not a pursuit of arthan kama a direct pursuit of arthan kama so that is a way to look at it. so we saw that pravritti and nivritti and within nivritti as one begins to appreciate this uh, parama purushartha moksha then the lifestyle changes for that person and so even though there is pravritti in that person's life now whatever that person does does is directed towards the fourth purushartha called moksha so we we talk about that kind of life bhagavad gita will talk about it a lot because arjuna has now come and he is now interested in moksha and so now his lifestyle will change and so we also learn a lot when krishna talks about karma yoga 
So that becomes a life of karma yoga. But if moksha is not there in the picture, then you have the pravritti marga. So that's 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 a a finer distinction within pravritti, where without being directly committed to moksha, all our activities, all our uh, so called regular activities are directed towards the final purushartha, parama purushartha moksha. So we saw that. And along the way, we saw the definition of who a nastika is one who, one who believes in the pramanyatvam, one who believes that the Veda is a Pramana for, for everything it says, including Moksha, including Ishvara, including Atma, that person is an Asthika. We saw that. So now today I was hoping we will do a couple of things. We talked about Pramana means of knowledge. So we have to allow this means of knowledge to work. Any means of knowledge. So if I have to use my eyes to see something, then I have to use my eyes. Sometimes it's very obvious. Sometimes it's very obvious. This is, somebody says, this is a green pen. I look at it and immediately say, yes, that's a green pen. Over, the knowledge has happened. But sometimes if somebody says, I will show you, uh, today Saturn is there. Tonight, you can see Saturn in the sky. If they say, I am a person who, who has not seen any planets in the sky who didn't even know that you could see planets like that. So moon is the only object because it's big. I can recognize it. Sun is the only object that also can be recognized. But other than that, everything is a star for me. I know nothing about how to see planets. And so then somebody takes me. They will either show a binoculars or they have to, somebody has to teach me. Somebody has to direct my eyesight towards that object. And that's a technique. And finally, if, if I'm patient, I will be able to see Saturn in the sky. Or Raj Vedam periodically posts all these pictures on Facebook. So that's how we get to know some of these things. <clears throat> so then time has to be spent. We should allow the means of knowledge to work. So same thing here also, when we are studying Vedanta. If I am the solution, if I am the solution, I have at this moment no reason, no reason to deny, no reason to deny that fact. I can't refute that fact. I can say, I can be surprised by this Mahavakya that Vedanta is telling us. But I can't, I don't have enough arguments to refute it. So I accept it for the time being and go along with the, with the Vedas and let the Vedas do the job. And the job is being done by words. Shabda Pramana, we call it. I suppose these days, uh, people use videos and uh, slides to to unfold any particular topic. And I sup suppose there are people who will talk about Vedanta also by showing slides and things like that. I've not done it. But I imagine how they used to do it those days. Such an old topic, <laughs> very old topic. And uh, it has always come through a Guru Shishya Parampara. And my Guruji has never used uh, slides 
But somehow those words, always been through words. Fancy charts are not seen in Vedanta. Panchakosha charts, you know, uh, you know, all those schematics and all. I've not seen all that. Very interesting. So everything is just words. So amazing it is. Words are spoken and the subject matter is understood and it is being taught again by somebody to somebody else. So by words, what we mean is not simply words in a particular language, English or Sanskritam. These words create knowledge when used properly. They have pramajanyatva. The ability to create knowledge is there for words. So we'll talk a little bit about that today. So two kinds of knowledge first. One is If I ask you what is this, immediately you will say it looks like a ball. It's a ball. Okay, I will press it a little bit and I will show it to you. So now you all know this is an exercise ball. These days some of us have to use this ball periodically. So our, our wrist doesn't get jammed uh, working on the computer. Our fingers, you know, finger joints don't get jammed. So it's an exercise ball. It's direct perception. Let's assume that you, let's assume that there is no, there is no defect in these, in these video and audio systems. And you see exactly what I'm showing you. So you can believe this is a ball. This is an exercise ball. So direct knowledge. So you can say Jai Kumar has a red exercise ball in his room. Over fact is understood, direct knowledge. Perception, inference are all direct knowledge. We use perception and inference. Anything we get out of that is called direct knowledge. And direct knowledge is very important in certain, certain situations. Sometimes inferences are acceptable. When you are driving, when you are driving your vehicle, whether it's a two-wheeler or a car, you're standing in front of, there's a red light you saw, you stopped. And now, now the light has changed to green. You saw the green light also, Pratyaksham. And now you have decided to go. You have decided to go on what basis? See, now I have to make some conclusions. Inference I have to make. I have to make an important conclusion that the other set of lights on the road that is perpendicular, that other set of lights is working. The other people on going on that road have seen that light. Second inference you have to make. And that light should be red when it is green for me. So many things you have to make a conclusion. All these are inferences. There is no pratyaksham at all. None of us have seen that light, the other light, that is what it is showing, etc. And the fourth conclusion you have to make is the fellow who is looking at that light has seen it as it is, has seen that red and has stopped that also and will stop. That also conclusion you have to make. See, look at this. Four important points which I have no idea of. This is why we start the journey with the prayer, I suppose. These are four things. This is why accidents happen also. Because there is a guy who comes and uh, he wants to beat the light or this is Friday night. So he is, uh, 
he is seeing a lot of lights there you know you should see only red light but uh, the head is swimming and he he sees a few more lights he sees green also so he decides to go so all this happen because inference i am making an inference very important inference and that inference could be flawed and so we said direct knowledge before pratyaksham and anumanam is direct knowledge but now you have to talk about indirect knowledge indirect knowledge means everything i have taken for granted that this is how it should be when my 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 signal is red in color or my signal is green in color the other signal must be non green must be either yellow or i mean red red is preferable must be red big conclusion so this we call indirect knowledge very important piece of knowledge in our life if you carefully analyze our activities in a, in, a, in a given hour or a given day you will see how amazing it is how much inference we use so indirect knowledge in some places direct knowledge is given a lot of importance so a court case is going on judge is there jury is there defendant is there prosecutor is there witnesses are coming and going and saying some things this is a murder case and people are saying you know the witnesses are saying many things about who shot who died all this they talk about and one fellow says uh, i saw the gunshot i i mean i heard the gunshot he says it was 7 in the evening and i heard the gunshot there were two gunshots at that time very important witness for 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 the for the whole proceedings then the pros the pros the uh, the defendant the the defendant lawyer will ask the question hey did you hear a gunshot yes how many how many gunshots did you hear i i heard two one after the other or a little bit there was a gap between the two oh one after the other okay good where were you standing i was standing on the road was there traffic on the road yes there was traffic on the road lot of vehicles going yes lot of vehicles going is it possible that somebody started their motorcycle and the motorcycle could have made that noise uh yeah i suppose it's possible but it is not it, but it was a, it was a gunshot is it possible that it was a you know we've seen all these tv shows right the way they argue and movies and all we've seen no no is it possible yeah yeah it is possible and then he rests his case he says see i think this guy heard two two sounds from a motorcycle we need to find out what that motorcycle is that becomes a problem no my person did not shoot in fact he did not even have a gun in his hand so now the judge is asking for eyewitness they are looking for eyewitness look at this very important phrase eyewitness so that shows that even this hearing while it may be an extremely good means of knowledge it can provide solid evidence still not as solid as this eyewitness did you see the person shoot <coughs> if you have not seen it then uh, okay we will take all the data you give but we have to do more investigation so direct knowledge has an important role to play in certain circumstances and we use indirect knowledge in our life in our daily life we use it quite a bit so just a repeat of what indirect knowledge can be
if somebody comes to me and says, uh, so last week one friend visited me. He said, uh, we went to Jaipur. We went to Rajasthan. Okay, Rajasthan. So I know there is a place called Rajasthan. I know there is a place called Jaipur. I've read a little bit about that. I've never been to Rajasthan. So everything he tells me, he talks of this Hava Mahal. He, this, this boy, this, this person's son, is just in sixth grade, he's explaining to me all about Hava Mahal. It seems it has five floors. Each floor is given a name. And the topmost floor is called something else. I think Hava Sagar or something like that. I forget now. And so he's telling me so vividly. He's showing me a picture also. Is this direct knowledge or indirect knowledge? Suppose I ask you. Then, have you seen this Hava Mahal? If somebody asks me, I have, to, I, have, I have to say, no, I have not seen Hava Mahal. How can I see it? And these days, thanks to all these wonderful pictures and videos, we get, a, we get glimpses of so many things we can't even imagine. So I have some idea of Hava Mahal, Jaipur, Rajasthan, people, what kind of dresses they wear, everything I have some idea about. So that idea, I will put it in the category of indirect knowledge. Indirect knowledge because I have not really seen it with my eyes. I have not heard the music with my ears. So we can say indirect knowledge. But with so many audio video in front of us, so many instruments in front of us. My friend cannot be lying to me. I believe what he says. She says. And so this knowledge that I have is almost as good as direct knowledge. Indirect knowledge even though almost as serves the purpose of direct knowledge. Okay. So I can get indirect knowledge of things that are away from me that are not visible to me, that are somehow obstructed from my field of sense organs. I cannot see it, hear it, taste it, touch it, smell it. So objects that are away, I can get indirect knowledge. Objects that are perceivable, I can get direct knowledge. Very straightforward. Now, here is a question. We said Vedas are Shabda Pramanam. So Vedas talks about things like Swarga. Is Swarga direct knowledge or indirect knowledge? If we ask, if somebody were to ask us, is Indra Loka? Is that direct knowledge or indirect knowledge? It is pretty obvious. I have not seen it. I have only heard it. I have seen so many stories and heard so many stories. This Kailasa and Vaikuntha is almost as real as existent for me. I am a Bhakta. I am a Vaidika. So, indirect knowledge, but I believe it. It's. I will say they exist. That's how much I believe in the Vedas. I say, yeah, Kailasa exists. I don't know where it exists, but it exists. Indirect knowledge. But the question is, the words of the Vedanta, which is what we are more interested in now. The words of Vedanta, which tell us about ourselves. Which tell me about who I am which is telling me this Mahavakyam that I have nothing to grieve that I, I am not who I think I am that statement after all it is just a few words and with some explanation and background and more elaboration and things like that are those words do they give me direct knowledge or do they give me indirect knowledge? This is the question. 
a million dollar question as they say very important question so so we will say right now we won't analyze it too much but we will say am i known to me or not if i ask you are you known to you that i that is being discussed do does that i exist or not first question let's let's sort that out first do i exist then we are forced to say i think that yeah something tells me i exist i don't have to feel my i don't have to pinch myself and and check out if i exist or not this existence seems to be there yes i exist but if i exist is there then who is this i that exists what is the nature of that i am i am i a mortal or am i immortal so these questions are very typical questions in uh, when once we get into vedanta when when somebody asks me that question that is where confusion starts then i will say don't ask me all these questions i am a mortal i, I don't i don't know any better but the shastram says i am not mortal the body may be mortal but i am not mortal so then that i is not clearly understood and the words that reveal that i reveal the nature of that i we say that is direct knowledge so a guy from america visits india and that guy loves this india so much for whatever reason he can't explain why but he says wow this is a great country he goes around he goes to temples he goes to places and he simply takes the bus and goes amazing guy i may think two times before saying what kind of bus you know is it ac bus or is it this bus or that nothing he just buys a ticket just goes in. that's it so he goes around and a good friend of mine and then uh, he he explains he says jay kumar i like this fruit very much this is available only here in india and he tells me yellow in color you know and he shows draws the shape and all i said oh this is this is jack fruit yeah yeah where did you eat it i ate it uh, you know when i crossed the when i was going towards towards tanjavur from from coimbatore after this panruti and all comes there these fellows are selling it i had some some of that very tasty and ever since then i've been having that fruit wherever i can get it so he tells that then uh, so he remembers this yellow fruit okay then next year he does the same thing he comes back comes to visits india and he visits me and uh, i offer him this yellow fruit he said oh, wow great and he he has that fruit jack fruit he has jack fruit next day next day i get him another something it's a big it's a big it's a big fruit and uh, it has all these thorns on it and he is asking me this fruit is weighing 10 kilos tell me what is this and uh, i tell him this is jackfruit 
this is jackfruit i tell you what this is jackfruit the same fruit that you've had all these years the same yellow fruit this fruit now looks green in color very big but the fruit you had is yellow in color that fruit it comes from this big fruit that little thing which has seeds yellow comes from this fruit he says really this is jackfruit yes this is jackfruit wow all these years i've been eating i didn't know this yes this is jackfruit so the words this is jackfruit those words are so important here which created the knowledge because jackfruit is there very much in front of his eyes he saw that big fruit lying when i was not there he came home and he saw it he saw it but he has no idea what this thing is this is a very weird thing i saw it whether it is a plant or an animal also i don't know it looks a little weird it looks like a big head with with some thorns on it i don't know so the fruit is very much there pratyaksham is there but knowledge is not there so that's an important point to note here the fruit is very much in front of my eyes his eyes but he doesn't know anything about that fruit until he is told this is jackfruit and then he says wow he says wow means understood wow means everything understood so words revealing direct knowledge words have the capacity to reveal direct knowledge i want to give another example an example we we studied in school i studied in school it's the example where and many of you know this example if you have studied vedanta you know otherwise you may know it so the the it's morning time 6 o'clock 6:30 people are all getting up at home father is getting up son has got up daughter has got up wife is busy somewhere else and newspaper man has come delivered the newspaper in america these days also they deliver newspaper in a in a plastic bag they come and throw like this this guy comes and throws very interesting so there also they still deliver newspapers i don't know when it's going to stop but we will see it goes on so delivers newspaper and you can the 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 the, the father is reading newspaper typical if he is a if he is a typical tamil person he will be reading the newspaper and coffee will be delivered everything will come on his table and all he has to do is sit and read the newspaper now there is a knock on the door somebody is knocking he he keeps the newspaper down and he goes finishes the job somebody has come and uh, maybe the the milkman has come he brought a packet of milk taken all that is over he comes back ready to resume his wonderful wonderful story of all the wonderful politics that are happening in india and suddenly he says where are my glasses where are my glasses so he is looking around he searches around like this on the table next to the chair glasses are not available where are my glasses one advantage of having a family is you can scream and somebody will hear and chances are good somebody will respond to that also and if you have children that's good you can make them work go there go there and see look at my bedroom is it there or not so we can make them run around so his screaming has started and he can't stand for a minute not reading this newspaper hey where are my glasses now the fun starts and the search is beginning you know son is gone somewhere else the daughter has gone to the bathroom 
and the, the mother is saying, wife is saying, come on, you were the one who were reading the newspaper. You should know where your glasses are. We don't keep track of where your glasses are. And you were just reading five minutes ago. What happened? Look around. Just look around. On the table, it must be there. You always, you always ask this question in the morning. Say something else in the morning. So the, all this wonderful conversation happens. And uh, the son says, no, dad, it's not available here. Not available in the bedroom. Daughter says, not available in the bathroom. And he gets up and he's furious and he walks around and nothing happens. Meantime, these guys are figured out. Meantime, the, the boys, girls, the boys, girls, the wife have figured out where the glasses are. But they decided they got to have a little fun with this man. He's creating so much problem. Now we got him. So while, while this fun can last, we will make it last. So he says, Dad, what happened? It's not there here. It's not there. What about, what about, uh, what about the television? You may have kept it on top of the TV. So he goes and looks on top. Not available. Then they have fun like this for a while. Did he keep it in the veranda? No, I looked around, not there. Then, then the son says, Dad, I found out. Nana, I can run I found out where it is. Really, really? You found out? Where is it? It's in the bathroom. Yeah, you kept it in a place. I'll show you. He says, come. So, they go to the bathroom. It's a big, nice mirror there. And he says, see, look, there it is. Where? Look at the mirror. Look at the mirror. He looks at the mirror. And uh, the father is, the father is absolutely speechless. Because uh, the glasses are very much there, very much there on the head. The father has nothing to say. He's very sheepish. He has a sheepish look on his face. And all this anger and all went away, replaced by some weird looks on the face. Oh, sorry or something like that, he might say. Wow, whatever. So, this, I remember this story, some Kuchu, I think was the name, example of Kuchu, Kuchu story. So here is a very nice example of a story where words create knowledge. Even if he did not see the glasses, he could be sitting on the chair very much. And the son could have said, Dad, you, your, your glasses are with you. It's on your head. That's all the son could have said. You leave the mirror example aside. These words, these words that said, hey, the glasses are with you. They're on your head. That is enough. Those words are enough. He doesn't have to see the glasses. Those words are enough to create the knowledge. Create the knowledge of the fact that this, I am the guy who is searching for glasses. I am the searcher of glasses. But it so happens that I am also the possessor of glasses. And words are all that are needed. A, you are the possessor of glasses. Stop searching first. Stop searching. Listen to me. Listen. Stop shouting at people. Start shouting at others for your problems. Just listen, relax. I will tell you. And so that's the approach. And the words at that point create the knowledge. So we give this example. It's an example we give to say that Words can create direct knowledge. Perception is not used. Inference is not used. Just hearing of words is enough to create this knowledge. Okay, so 
So I employ, we saw the example the other day, I have to employ this means of knowledge. Like I have to employ my eyes, I have to operate Vedanta and let it prove for itself. Whatever it says. So if I say, no, no, Vedanta is untenable. Vedanta, this is unbelievable. This cannot be true if I say. That is fine. Simple answer is, you have to operate it and see. You can't simply say, it, is, it won't work. That is not acceptable. You have to try to make it work. And you prove or disprove. You can do that. You have the right to do that. So, whatever, I, whatever views I have about Vedanta, if I have to prove, then I have to operate this means of knowledge and see what happens. That should be the approach. <clears throat> okay, so Vedanta, allowing Vedanta to work by letting the words do the magic, by letting the words help myself. We will see all that later. So that is the process. This whole, whole so-called teaching and learning falls in this category of operating the means of knowledge called Vedanta. So I thought now we will spend a little bit of time and understand the Upanishads are Pramana. The Vedas are Pramana. Upanishads are there in the Vedas. They are all Pramana. Now how is the Bhagavad Gita in Pramana? Bhagavad Gita, we said earlier, is Paurushayam or Apaurushayam. It is Paurushayam because it is not, it is authored by, by Veda Vyasa. If you consider him as the author of the Mahabharata. Authored by a person. So it's Paurushayam. So it does not have the status of the Vedas yet. We say that the, the, the Bhagavad Gita teaches the same thing that is being taught in the Upanishads and that's why we use the word Gita Shastram. We don't use the word Shastram just like that. The word is reserved for certain things like, like Bhagavad Gita, Gita Shastram, we say, because it says nothing that is not there in the Upanishads. Or I should put it differently. It does say a few things here and there which are not there in the Upanishads because the context is a war here. So some war related language will be there. War related activity will be there. That is not there in the Upanishads. But the essence, Brahma Vidya, whatever is taught in Upanishads is being taught here in the Bhagavad Gita. And uh, it is a Pramana Grantha. Pramana Grantha, it is a Pramanam. Few reasons for that. <clears throat> well, first reason, of course, is what it says. Our teachers tell us that whatever the Bhagavad Gita says is what is there in Upanishads, what is there in the Vedas. And how do we say that? How do we come to that conclusion? Veda Vyasa wrote the Mahabharata, wrote the Bhagavad Gita. Vyasa was the author of the Vedas, well, at least compiler of the Vedas. And Namostute Vyasa Vishala Buddhe. We start the wonderful prayer which praises the mind of Vyasa, Vishala Buddhe. Only a person of such a vast mind can write the Mahabharata, can write this 18 Puranas. These Puranas are going and going on and on and on. And such a mind has written the Bhagavad Gita. So it has to be in keeping with the Vedas. It cannot be otherwise. And, uh, and, where, and also where Vyasa presents Krishna as an avatara. Avatara Vada is there in the fourth chapter. And in the fourth chapter, Krishna seems to also say explicitly, 
Imam Vivaswati Yogam Proktavana Hamabjayam. So he says, hey Krishna, Arjuna, this is not a new topic I'm teaching. Imam Vivaswati Proktavan. I taught this to Vivaswan, that sun which you can see in the sky, Ishvara, sun god. Him also I taught. Like that he says. So, based on all these all these data points I have, I accept Krishna as Ishvara. And whatever is said in the Bhagavad Gita must be what is said in the Upanishads also. So that much we can say about Bhagavad Gita and say Bhagavad Gita is a Pramanam. It cannot but be a Pramanam. That portion of the Mahabharata which is just located it's a shining, sometimes they will use the words, a shining pendant within the Mahabharata is a Pramanam. So I'm looking at the clock. We have about five minutes left. <clears throat> so I want to cover one more topic here, which is the topic of Bhagavan. What is Bhagavan? Very beautiful analysis is there. And uh, so there are six qualities. Six qualities are there. See, one thing about this word Bhagavan is it is very similar to many words we know in, in, in sound at least. So Balavan, Gunavan, Ye Balavan hai. If somebody says, what is the meaning of that? Balawan means one who has bala is called balawan. One who has good qualities, guna, is called gunawan. Viryavan, one who has courage, is called viryavan. So you can use any word you want. You can say, he has a home. So grihavan, you can create a new word called grihavan. Perfectly, grammatically correct word. Grihavan. So, Bhagavan also must mean the same thing. One who has Bhaga is called Bhagavan. Okay, that is the first uh, observation we make. So, the next question, immediate, the immediate question that follows is what is Bhaga? If I knew what is Bhaga, then I can understand what Bhagavan is. So, Bhagavan, Vati also is the same thing. Balavati. Gunavati, same thing, feminine gender. So this this vat, vat suffix in Sanskrit brings in that meaning. One who possesses that particular attribute is, is called by that name. So the first quality then will be jnanam, knowledge. The one who has knowledge in full measure, how much ever knowledge one can have, we don't know how much that can be. That knowledge in full measure must be there. These six qualities that we are going to talk about, it must be there in full measure. It must be there in absolute measure. Cannot be relative. Cannot be like he knows more than me, she knows more than me. Not that kind of more. This has to be absolute. So, jnanam. Then, vairagyam. Vairagyam means uh, dispassion. There cannot be any longing for anything, there cannot be a sense of insecurity. Security in full measure, that is Vairagyam. Then we have Viryam. Viryam is a, a kind of Shakti. Viryam and Shakti in this case, same thing. What kind of Shakti, what kind of power? Power to create, sustain and dissolve. Srishti. Sthiti, Laya, Shakti. 
power to create what we call this world once a world is created it has to be somehow somehow managed somehow sustained that shakti is sthiti shakti and laya shakti this shakti trayam is called viryam that viryam has to be there in absolute measure jnanam vairagyam viryam and then yashas yashas means fame fame very interesting very interesting all of us have fame some amount of fame at least at home we are famous one good thing about having a home is we can be at least famous for a short while in some place so yashas is there so we may have some name and fame whatever little it is there and we say that fame also belongs to ishwara but ishwara's fame has to be absolute there cannot be a more a superlative in terms of fame so yashas is another attribute then shri 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 is the fifth attribute she can mean many things it can also mean knowledge in some contexts but here we will say all resources all kinds of wealth that is needed that is needed to survive all material wealth etc any anything that you consider as a resource as a support as something that one needs as the world needs food all that comes under this shri so shri and the last quality of bhagwan our last quality which is which is a constituent of bhaga is aishwaryam aishwaryam means or lordship or lordship one who see or lordship how do you imagine you entered the room you opened the door and you saw an ant right there in front of you you saw an ant now tell me you're not scared of this ant you can now you have full power to do whatever you want to do to this ant you can let it go you can say i'm going to pick it up and put it outside you can do many number of things you can do other things also or lordship full full authority full full power over something so bhaga means one uh, one who cannot be lorded over by anything else or anybody else <coughs> that is called aishwarya so this these are the six attributes of uh, <coughs> of uh, of this bhaga meaning of the word bhaga there is a nice verse also which talks about it aishwar aishwaryasya samagrasya viryasya yashasha shriya ஜனாம்ப்ளாய்டுப் we saw that briefly direct knowledge indirect knowledge two types and more importantly the words of vedanta the words of the veda must be direct knowledge we cannot accept that being indirect knowledge like somebody telling me about rajasthan not that kind of knowledge it has to be knowledge crystal clear knowledge about who i am like the guy who was searching for his glasses words revealed the knowledge we saw that and we saw about bhagavad gita why we consider that as a pramanam and just began understanding what bhaga is 
because Bhagavan is the subject of matter of all these scriptures, all this the Shastram, Bhagavad Gita itself starts with the word Bhagavan. So we, we said, let's understand a little bit about Bhagavan. So I'll pause with that. It's about uh, seven five here. I think last time there was a question. Uh, I don't remember now. It's not coming to me. But if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to ask. So Mahesh ji, did you raise your hand? Yes. Uh, namaste, everybody. Um, the, uh, the question I have is, so the, the examples you gave, two examples, uh, Jaipu, or even the traffic light, um, that also can be a, a knowledge pending verification. Even like in a traffic light, you've seen people not crossing the other side, so you know, so you wait a little bit whether anybody comes, crosses or not. So you verify that people are stopping indeed, and then you move. So, so where is the difference between a indirect knowledge and the knowledge pending verification? Yeah. So that example was given to only demonstrate the importance of inference, importance of indirect knowledge. I have not seen the, I have not seen the red light on the other side. I have not, there are so many things we said that have to align for me to go through this green light. So that example I gave only to show the importance, the, such a, the importance of this inference that we make. Indirect knowledge is also very important knowledge. That was the that was the purpose of that example. Okay, mm. and we may be able to stretch it and do other things. But the example, so there also, so knowledge pending verification means uh, yes, the proof, the proof proof that uh, they have seen the red light, etc. Yeah, I suppose it gets verified when traffic keeps moving and everybody follows the rules, then it gets verified. And it may get verified even there is an accident, it can get verified, I suppose. Uh, so, so that verification part is there. But yeah, that is, I don't want to stretch the example too much. Because I wanted to use it only for the purpose of demonstrating that indirect knowledge is very important knowledge. Just because something is indirect, we don't put it down or anything like that. From day one, from the minute we wake up, we use indirect knowledge to make uh, to to move on with our lives. Okay, so the anumanam also is a, like a knowledge pending verification, right? So that that was my question. Uh, what is the first word you said? Anumanam. Ha. Anumanam. Acha acha. Anumanam is knowledge pending verification. Yeah, yeah. That's Absolutely. What's my? What is the difference between? These two. That's what's my question. Anumanam also is knowledge. Now, see, see, that is not necessarily true. Anumanam itself is a means of knowledge. Yes, in this case, in this case, you have, you have, we say, you have all the data to believe, to believe that they have seen the green, red, red light and to believe that you can, you can cross the road. Yes. And so that's an important anumana that itself is a means of knowledge. See, okay, sure. that itself is a means of knowledge. We don't need to verify it anymore. Inference, we don't say should be verified. Inference applies only when you have some data points, number one. And this, the important data point we are using here is if I see green, the other people should be seeing red. That is that is the logic we use. We know that the systems are like that. Well, that's how it should work. And with the logic and the data, that is enough to make your inference. And that's 
paka inference no problem there so inference also is a means of knowledge need not be verified and the verification etc in this example i suppose you can verify that the lights may not work properly all this can be there but 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 in general inference anumanam itself is a means of knowledge so if i see smoke i know there is fire in a stock example so there is no need to verify that there is fire true okay. there is no need to verify because that vyapti that logic that you you have this knowledge in you that there cannot be smoke without fire that's such an important piece it's a law it's a, it's a law it's a uh, it's a law that cannot be violated and so inference there works just fine in fact all our you know every lab medical lab that is doing taking our blood and saliva and all that and doing tests everything is based on inference and series of inferences goes on and on and on and uh, very important and they are also i they they are also all those things we can say assuming the sciences are all validated when a sci science has to be proven okay then we say that is uh, anumanam and that's a means of knowledge true yeah. okay okay thank you yeah vishnu uh, shri guru ji namaha Uh, sir, actually, uh, um, uh, you have uh, discussed the six qualities of Bhagawan, and so my uh, doubt is that uh, this thing, uh, Krishna Paramatma is referred to as Paramatma sometimes, Bhagawan sometimes, or if I am going to a Krishna temple, uh, Krishna Devalaya, De Devam, it is uh, uh, he is referred to. Sometimes Krishna Sanugram is called as Deva Nugram. So uh, why why are uh, there are different terms and each and every one seem to have a different meaning is it on purpose and uh, uh, why is that some uh, this, this was the basic doubt i was having that is question number one and question number two uh, was regarding the inference uh, can i classify the whole rational thinking as based on uh, inference only direct perceptive inference only this were the two questions yeah so second question first so uh, yeah rational thinking means using pratyeksham and anumanam properly properly means what i i, I should not make up my own loss so if i start making up and uh, i can't be considered rational and so if you are using data's data point as they are and uh, we we make inferences based on some prior knowledge of certain facts it's all it's all rational thinking so you no know, in 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 newspaper and uh, on the web we read a lot of uh, articles analysis articles that analyze what's going on so politics hey what's going on in india what's what what will happen in 2019 so a lot of noises there a lot of things going on in all over the states and all kinds of parties doing all kinds of things we need somebody who can make sense out of all this so some, sometimes you get some good articles good commentary which analyzes all this and say you know this bjp is that congress is that etc this is what can happen then it it really illumines you and because my eyes are not capable of seeing all these things but based on the facts based on data and based on some inferences an explanation is put forward and i can buy that i can i can say yeah that sounds reasonable so yeah rational thinking means using uh, not violating pratyeksham not violating anumanam uh, the first question you asked was uh, different names for bhagwan yeah so uh, even uh, even every person has different names you know mother is called so many different names at home amma ma mother and uh, you know called by names also so many names one person has so that's the glory of a human being is uh, person can have many names and uh, depending on the role they play names will change and uh, so like that ishwara also different roles different functions different functions so our devtas are all having so many different names so krishna also 
Giridari. Giridari is the name. Giridhar, you know, you say. Somebody's name is Giridhar. Giridhar means what? Goes back to the story where Krishna lifted a mountain by with his little finger. So that glory comes out, that story comes out with this one word. And you can worship Krishna as Krishna, Krishna as Govardhan, Giridhari, etc. And uh, Madhusudana, Kesha. So all this we can say. Keshava, Madhava, all these are there. So different names, of course, because the glory is so much Vishnu. The glory of Ishvara, the glory of the human being itself is there. So much is there. But glory of Ishvara is so much that he or she cannot have but so many names. And yeah, each name has a meaning. No doubt about that. Like Bhaga, we can define Paramatma also what it is. Deva has a meaning. Effulgent, the most effulgent is called Deva. So like that, all these have very beautiful meanings and applies, uh, they can be used synonymously also. They can be used specifically also in certain occasions. Yeah, Arapasad. So we bio namaha. Jayakumar, I had two questions to you. <coughs> One is, you said Bhagavan, Viryavan, like that. Is Hanuman has any anything to do with the any meaning? Yes, yes. Um so And I'll ask you the second question after you answer. Yeah, so Hanu, I think Hanu in Sanskrit means chin. Uh, chin or uh, I think maybe if, uh, I think the chin is what is highlighted. Hanuman's has a very, very uh, pronounced chin. So one who has that pronounced chin, one who is known for their chin is called Hanuman. Same, same derivation. Hanumat becomes Hanuman, Hanumati. A female who has that will be called Hanumati. Yes, go ahead. Okay. The second thing is, you said in the Bhagavan, the six qualities, Bhaga, the major six qualities. But is six anywhere connotated in the word Bhagavan? No, no, not connotated in the, not explicitly mentioned, obviously. So the word Bhaga has been given this meaning. I think that comes in Vishnu Purana. So again, this must be the game Vyasa is playing. So Vyasa gives the meaning of the word Bhaga because Vishnu Purana, right? So somewhere I read, I think it's Vishnu Purana. So you can validate that. And uh, so there, uh, Veda, uh, Vyasa Maharshi himself says it. So that's where it comes from. Okay. So if there are no other questions, we will uh, stop here with a prayer. <coughs> Swasti Prajabhyaf Paripala Yantam Nyayena Margena Mahim Mahisha Go Brahman Epesh Bhamastunityam Loka Samasta Sukhino Bhavantu Kale Varshatu Parjanyaha Prithuvi Sasya Shalini Desho Yam Shobharahitaha Brahmana Santu Nirpayaha Om Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha Sarve Santu Niramayaha Sarve Bhadrani Pashantu Ma Kaschit Dukha Bhag Bhavet Asato Ma Sadgamaya Tamaso Ma Jyotir Gamaya Vrityor Ma Amritangamaya Om Pur Namadaf Pur Namidam Pur Nath Pur Namudachyate Pur Nasya Pur Namada Yapur Nameva Vashishyate Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Shri Guru Pyo Namaha Hari Om